Lecture 11. This is it, the last, well, it's not the last week. This is the last week of new stuff. Next week, there is a class. Um, there is a revision lecture. The chutes are on. Right, cash flow. You guys do cash flow in undergrad. Well, you are undergrad, what am I talking about? You guys do cash flow in first year. <laughs> That's a concern. That's why we do it again. That's why we repeat topics, because we get quick comments like that about, really, we did that? Um, as far as I'm aware, talking to the people that teach first year, you do cash flows in first year, as far as I understand. So to an extent, this may be, be something that you have seen before, but nevertheless, it is still useful to go over it um, because we're going to look at some of the rules behind it and some of the things, some of the detail which is important in there, plus a few other bits and pieces which I think are kind of interesting. Hopefully you guys think are interesting as well, but we shall get to them. So what cash flows are, why cash flow statements are important, the regulation around cash flow statement, which resides in WSB 107, which basically splits it up into operating, investing, and financing cash flows. Is there another? Nope. Come back. The thing about cash flows is, and kind of similar to last week's topic, last week's topic, um, it's not about, it's not really about policy choice. It's not about management going, okay, well, we can capitalize, we can capitalize this asset or we can expense all this stuff out. It's not about, do we do this as an operating lease or a finance on lease? And there's some scope there for choice about things. Tax, which is what we did last week, was very much, this is just how they have to do stuff. Um, there's not really choice in the way, they did, way that they do it. Cash flows, again, for the most part, are not about choice. It's just this is around presentation, it's around disclosure, it's about giving information in a more standardized format. Because if you did allow, not companies how to choose what a cash flow is, but how to sort of what activity to describe them under, and that can lead to some problems. And we'll see why that, why that happens. So cash flows, as defined by the standard, are just simply flows of cash. Accounting is not, if, not anything if not sort of logical from, for the most part. Inflows and outflows of cash, and something we haven't seen before, but cash equivalents. So it's just cash moving in and out of the business. Now, why cash flow statements are important. For a long period of time, these weren't mandated. You didn't have to necessarily provide a cash flow statement. Quick show of hands, how many of you guys are doing finance as a major? All right, so quite a few. You've probably got a sense in finance that cash flows are very much an important part of the analysis in, in what they do in finance. Would that be reasonably fair to say for those that are doing it? Not too sure? Yes, yes? cool. That's the answer I was looking for. <laughs> What's with it with this part of the room? I can't remember what I did last year, don't know what I'm doing in finance. Anyway, look. A lot of people in finance consider cash as pretty much the, pre, is the primary thing that they look at because they see concerns with what accounting does with its numbers. Um, if you go back to week one, you go back to week two, this idea talking about canning, that accounting profit is just whatever you get out with after you've done all this stuff to it. Investment advisors advocate comparing earnings to cash flow from operations and consider a wide disparity, a red flag on the basis that cash flow from operations is more real than earnings. Because accounting has a huge amount of subjectivity in it. And that's what you should be reflecting on as we, we're not looking at, at accounting numbers, arguably, at this point in time. We're looking at cash flow numbers. But what we've done over the last three months or so is to look at accounting numbers. We looked at how you come up with, prop, with property, 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 plant and equipment. We've looked at provisions for long service leads, we looked at financial instruments, we looked at leases. In a lot of this stuff, there are huge amounts of subjectivities involved. There are estimations, there's professional judgment. And there's good reason why, we, why that happens, and we'll, we'll explore that in a moment. Um, but it does also give rise to a concern. So both cash flows and income provide information on performance. So if you look up, look up a profit and loss statement, it will tell you how much profit that company has made. If you look up a cash flow statement, 
some of it, the, especially the cash flow from operations, will tell you how that company's performing in terms of its operating cash flows. But there are differences, and we'll just have a quick look at what they are. This is a really simple example. We've not got any expenses, we're not doing anything else. This is just a one year setup. So in that particular year, you sold $100,000 worth of stuff. Could be services, we don't have any cost of goods sold. During that year, you've also collected $95,000. Means, so if I've sold to all you guys, I've sold $100,000, 95 of you, $95,000 has been paid, you guys still owe me $5,000. We've had a change in a receivable or I've had a change in receivable. My income would be $100,000 based on this information. My cash flow from operations would be $95,000 because that is literally how much cash I've got from you. So if we consider what income is, income is very much an accounting number. And that accounting number is based on the cash effects that $95,000 that I've collected from you plus some accrual effects which have taken place. Which in this case is the increase in the accounts receivable. What assumption am I making to come up with an income just in relation to what's here, not in relation to sort of expenses at zero and all the rest of it, but just in relation to what's here, sales and accounts receivable and collections, what assumption am I making about the accounts receivable to get an income of $100,000? The, the, will we save it? Yeah, sure. yeah, we'll receive it for sure. We will receive 100% of what is owed. Do you think that is a reasonable assumption? That every single dollar of what a company is owed by its creditors will actually be repaid? No. no. So then the question is, it's not going to be zero. Should we go, they're going to receive zero of it. So we should take off and just write down and have an allowance for bad debt of $5,000. They are going to collect nothing of it. Does that seem reasonable? No, that doesn't seem, that seems pretty stupid as well. Somewhere within that range of no collection, sort of 100% collection and no collection is what's going to happen. But is it 1%? Is it 2%? Is it 5%? That is an inherently subjective number. And that allowance that you put in there is going to affect your profitability. We've assumed a 0% allowance for bad debts, which is why it's at 100,000. If we assumed a... 10% allowance for bad debts. This is going to test my mathematical skills. Probably should have thought about this beforehand. That will give rise to an income figure of 99,500. That sound about right? Yes, 99,500 because we're, we're estimating a $500 allowance for, bad, for doubtful debts. Bless you. Now, that, that 500 allowance for doubtful debts, that is an accrual number. It is subjective. Will it actually happen? We don't know. What happens if management have contracts in place around certain profit targets? That may bias that number. And it's not just accounts receivable or allowance for doubtful debts where this takes place. What do you think is one of the largest non-cash uh, non -cash expenses a company has? Depreciation. Exactly. Depreciation and amortization are for pretty much across the board for most companies, the largest non-cash expense item there is. Is that an objective number? What factors affect, what things get put in to create the amount of depreciation expense in a particular year? The yep, useful life is one. Estimating how long that useful life is gonna be is one. The, yeah, the residual value is going to be another. Is there anything else? Yeah, so it's cost, the useful life. Cost, we, can't, we should know. Residual value is at the end. That's an estimate. Useful life, that's an estimate. And the method we choose is also going to be a choice by management. So all of those things can change what our, what our depreciation expense is going to be. And it is the biggest expense or non-cash expense on there. Now... 
for Qantas 2014, their statutory loss for last year, they lost nearly $3 billion. And I want you to actually, it may be worthwhile, you can go and just pull this from the Qantas' annual report if you want. I'd also urge you, I don't know if we had got you to do it for the bonus assignment, think about having a look at the, your company that you're looking at and looking at what their biggest non-cash expense was. The statutory loss for Qantas was 2.8. Their operating cash flows from the cash flow statement was a billion dollars positive. So their accounting profit looked terrible. But that's not being driven by operations. It's not like no one was flying with Qantas and they were paying staff more than they were bringing in. That's not what drove that. What drove that, if you go into the reconciliation in the cash, not in the main cash flow statement, but if you go into the note reconciliation behind it, they had nearly $3 billion of impairment losses, which are non-cash items, creating a large part of that loss. Now, this is annoying because in a normal year, I could just say depreciation and amortization is the biggest thing. And generally speaking, it usually is. But in this year, it was swamped by an impairment loss. But depreciation and amortization is still close to $1.5 billion. You change that by a few percentage points, that's actually quite a big bottom line effect. Um, so there are things to consider. Now what we were talking about before with red flags, I think I'll do it with, on this slide. Now, I'll just preface, this is not what's happened with Qantas' cash flows and profit over time. This is just an arbitrary. Okay. So imagine you see a company's profit over time, over, you know, time series, five years, 10 years, whatever, and it's trending generally like that. What you would like to see, generally speaking, and I'll do it in a different color, What you'd like to see is cash flow from operations, could be higher, could be lower. But cash flow from operations generally fairly well correlated with profit. The gap between profit and cash flow from operations is going to be driven by your non-cash expenses. And yes, they're going to be different. There's not going to be absolutely perfect match between them. But what you'd like to see is those sort of decisions, those sort of things taking place, being fairly consistent across that time period. Where you start to get worried, and if you see this happening with companies, it is a cause for concern, is if it was coming up and potentially started to drift down or just started diverting away from what you saw with profit. Because what that's saying is management started making changes to their accrual policy from about this time period on. There's not underlying sort of cash flow things driving this. Cash flow has actually started to go worse, but they're doing something else to keep profit propped up. That is not necessarily saying something is wrong, but it is a red flag and that you want to double check, talk to management, do some digging, figure out why that is happening, and then figure out if you're comfortable that that's a legitimate reason or not. There may be nothing to see there, but it's something that which you look at and go, mm, I want to check into this. Because at the end of the day, what you're picking up with these things is that all the financial statements, whether it be the profit and loss statement, the cash flow statement, the balance sheet, they should triangulate. They should actually speak to each other and show a consistent result. If you see profit and CFO doing like the top two lines, profit and cash flow statement tend to be sort of singing to the same tune. If you see profit being the top line and cash flow from operations being the bottom line, something funny is happening there and you want to get to the bottom of it. Which brings me on to this example from New Zealand. I hope I've got the right slide and the right point. This example in New Zealand from 2009 of where companies want to make sure that things all marry up in their statements. Now, there was nothing actually untoward which happened. It was just an embarrassing setup by the company. That this, was a, this actually went out in their formalized reports 
I don't know if you can read it, but they actually had in the reconciliation of profit to cash flows, depreciation fudge this to equal depreciation in the finance in somewhere else. They actually had in a published annual report saying we're going to have to fudge this number to make something to make this all marry up. Now this is they weren't actually up to anything dodgy. Like this is just one where somebody has put a placeholder in to say, look, we've got to make sure that these decimals and everything out work together and then forgot to take it out before they released it to the market. I could say something not nice about Kiwis, but then again, they seem to be beating us at everything under the sun at the moment, so I won't. Um, but yeah, you've got to make sure everything marries up. Otherwise, you sort of leave holes and people go, what's going on here? Anyway, which actually brings me on to something, because today's topic, we can, we can talk a little bit about things. And this is the last time we get to talk about content. And I figured, given what the whole point of the subject was, was around information incentives and regulation, to talk about accounting and talk about information in a slightly different context and use what we've talked about over the last three or four months in a context which you may or may not actually usually think about. So what I want to focus on is charities and not necessarily the accounting charities do but more about actually the decision making that we do around when we give to charity. I'm presuming most people here at some point have either volunteered or given something to charity. My sister, when was it? My sister late last year did the Oxfam, 100, Oxfam trail walk which does anyone, actually, first of all, has anyone done it in the room? All right, cool. Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Oxfam Trail Walker? No, okay. It's a 100-kilometer one-day walk. So they walk from, I think they were coming south that year, so it's come up from the Central Coast down to, I think they finished up in Mossman. 100 kilometers, and the day that they did it, it was pouring rain the whole night. Um, I remember being sort of at home, having something to eat, just thinking, well, they're somewhere out in the, in the middle of the bush trekking through it and it's just horrible weather. Um, and look, and she hit me up for money, which I duly, I don't know what she was raising money for. I still gave her money, um, you know, she's family. But the thing we often don't do when it comes to charities is to think about where that money actually goes. You know, we may be sort of good citizens and sort of give out to friends when they're doing these sort of things or running marathons and doing whatnot. We often don't think about, does it actually go to the places which we think it goes to? Does this ring any bells? The ice bucket yeah, it's the ice bucket challenge. That was last year, I'm pretty sure. Was it last year or the year before? It might have been last year. What's it? Pass Did anyone do it? I would have done it, but I'm an accountant and no one, I've got no friends to actually challenge me for it, so I, I was waiting to do it. <sighs> anyway, um, ice bucket challenge. So this was last year. This feel, I can't believe how short cycles of things seem to happen. I thought this was like two or three years ago. It's only last year. Do you remember the Coney thing? That was like the year before. What? It, was that 2012? Was that that long ago? Now I'm just starting to feel. Anyway, I can't. I can't remember what I did last week, let alone what I, what I was doing four years ago. Anyway, an article came out about the ice bucket challenge. The ALS admits that 73% of donations are not used for ALS research. Now, I'm pretty sure if you put money into the ALS Foundation as part of this, you'd be pretty pissed if you read that and realized they weren't actually doing anything with it. But that begs the question, can you necessarily trust the media and is that true? Now, the 73% does relate to something, but it doesn't relate to what this article seems to be relating it to. But when you think about what you're doing when you give donations, you're in a way investing. You're putting money in so these companies, can, these organizations can do various things. We don't have finite, we don't have infinite amount of money. I can't give to every charity out there because I would run out of money. So we have to make choices about the charities we give to. So when you get those calls on the phone at home, which we do still have a landline, and they're like, you know, we're ringing up for rural fire <laughs> service, and you have to feel like a bit of a prick, but say, nope, we've already got our charities, thanks, bye. Um, we do have our charities and we do give to. So how do you make decisions between different charities? 
problem is in Australia, it's actually re relatively hard to do this because this sort of thing doesn't exist. But this is a US not-for-profit, and I just want to focus on this section. They aim to advance a more efficient and responsive philanthropic marketplace. That is a very similar sort of language to what we talk about with investments. They're talking about a marketplace. They're talking about making efficient decisions about what you do with it. That's pretty much the same idea in terms of investment decisions, except in a slightly different vein. Now I feel sad. You gonna go out and give to charity? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> there are trains. Um, anyway. So how does the ALS Foundation actually stack up? Actually surprisingly well. So they have, and this, rather than going through a whole bunch of numbers, they actually have this score, this matrix of financial and accountability. And the ALS Foundation actually ranks pretty much in the top quadrant for, for this. They actually do pretty well. Not all charities do, will come to that. Where the 73% comes from, that's actually what they do spend on programs. So that article actually got it completely around the wrong way. That is the money, so three out of every four dollars that this, this program gets actually is to what they say they're going to do with it. Only 10% goes to spend, goes to pay off admin and all the various other things to make this charity work. But just in case you think it's all rosy and, and you know, we can give it to charities willy-nilly, I just want you to take this on board. The 50 worst charities in the US over a 10-year period raised over $1.3 billion. That's not a small amount of money. And of that $1.3 billion, less than 4% of that went to where they said it was going to go to. That's pretty bad, to be honest. And I'm pretty sure from an investment point of view, if you're investing in a company and it's just, its financial performance is terrible, you aren't going to be happy with that. Similarly, if you're donating money to these sort of charities and you're making very little, and they're doing very little with it, and they're paying their CEOs and paying admin and all the rest of it, that's not a good thing. So I appreciate it's not necessarily related to cash flows, but I think these sort of things to think about what we've learned and the skills and the, and the things we've talked about in slightly different contexts is a good one to take forward. Right, back on the topic. So statement of cash flows. Presentation of cash flow statements, we need it because WSB 101 requires us to put it in there. Cash flow information provides users of financial statements with a basis to assess the ability of the entity to generate cash and cash equivalents and the needs of the entity to utilize those cash flows. Paragraph 111, requirements for presentation and disclosure. This is what it is about. It's not necessarily about choice about things. It's about taking a bunch of information about cash flows and telling the market what's going on with it. Because why do we need a cash flow statement if we've got a balance sheet? We've got an opening cash at balance. We've got an opening balance of cash. We've got a closing balance of cash. If you see an opening balance of cash of $1,000, a closing balance of $5,000, you add cash net inflows of $4,000. Why do we need to break it down any further than that? Not necessarily asking for an answer, but just to think about what We have information about what the net cash flows were. So why do we want to tease it out a little bit further? So in relation to presentation and disclosure, what I'm about to show you, this is the same six data points presented in different ways. So option A, so we've got six different things, sale of property, plant and equipment, new loans, customer receipts, interest payments, payments to suppliers and share buybacks. Totaling $410,000 of cash inflows. We could have just shown you cash inflow was 410. Cash inflow was 410. Tells you they're making more cash or more cash has come in. Why do we want to see, firstly, before we get to the organization of this, why is it useful to see that breakdown? Yeah, that's actually one of the primary reasons why we have financial statements, is to, to assess the cash generating ability of the entity, and obviously, where the money is going as well. 
where is, prim where is most of their money primarily coming from? <coughs> yeah, they're selling off non-current assets. Is that a sustainable thing? No, because at some point you're going to run out of things to sell. So, yes, they made a cash inflow, but their receipts are a very small proportion of that. Most of it is from selling property, plant, and equipment, and, most, and the rest seems to be coming from loans. They've borrowed money. So having a disaggregation is useful. The way I've set that up is just simply by size of the inflow, from, most, from the largest positive down to the largest negative. This is set up slightly differently. This is set up in the way that you normally see a cash flow statement done. So to putting together kind of operating activities, putting together investing activities, putting together financing activities. And what it helps you do is to get a, a little bit better of an indication of what is driving those cash flows. And it doesn't seem to be the firm's underlying operations doing that. Now, one of the reasons we have the standard is because we'll get to the details of this. This is the required format that we have. It's a standardized format. There is a little bit of scope for choice in there, but it's a fairly standardized setup to do it. If you have something standardized, it means it's e you've got different companies using the same setup. Comparing across them is going to be easier to do. If we give them no guidance as to what to do, they could just order it like this. They could put things together in just different ways. They could do it alphabetical. It will make it harder for people to assess the differences between those different companies. Um, that's why they're called accounting standards. They are providing a level of standardization. And standardization doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Um, having a level of standardization in many instances can actually be quite positive. And I'm not just talking about accounting. So 107 cash flows. <coughs> So cash comprises cash on hand, so the folding stuff, and demand deposits. So if you've got money in the bank, it's not actually your money in there. It's not like they've got a drawer and that's your money that you put in. You're actually accredited to the bank at that point. So it's on demand deposits as well. But this gets included. Cash equivalents are short-term, highly liquid investments that are readily convertible to known amounts of cash which is subject to an insignificant risk of changes in value. Not for the here and now, but something to think about over the next couple of weeks is what, have a look at annual reports, see if they talk about what these things are. What could you consider to be a cash equivalent? You could even argue potentially, although if it is actual cash, if you own cash in a currency which fluctu fluctuates quite strongly, and that changes in value significantly, should that be treated as cash? It changes in value a hell of a lot. Maybe it's something which shouldn't be. Maybe it should be something else. So the statement of cash flows shall report cash flows during the period classified by operating, investing, and financing activities, WSB 107, paragraph 10. Um, if you can remember back to first year, that's pretty much what you've looked at. And I'm not looking at anyone in person, anyone in particular. <clears throat> operating activities, so we'll look at the first one. So operating activities, principal revenue producing activities of the entity and other activities that are not investing or financing activities. These are obviously the bread and butter of companies. Yes, you can get cash inflows by flogging stuff off. Yes, you can get cash inflows by borrowing money. But at the end of the day, you're going to run out of things to sell and of non-current assets to sell, and you're going to banks are going to stop lending to you. So at some point, if you're going to be a successful business, your money has to come from here. So it is obviously a really important indicator of what you're going to do. So ultimately, you want to see this number getting positive. Early stage of the firm, depending on where it is in this life cycle, obviously that's not necessarily going to be the case. But at the end of the day, you want this positive because that's what drives profits. Um, 
And you may be seeing some of it with the new tech companies now, but certainly if you go back to the turn of the century, seems weird, it seems like a long time ago now. Um, but if you go back to the turn of the century with the tech boom, you had companies valuations which are skyrocketing, all these internet companies and, and dot coms. They weren't making money. They weren't, a lot of them didn't even have sales. If you're not selling stuff, like you can get clicks on a page and you can get eyeballs and all the rest of it and sort of time on, time on the screen. But at the end of the day, if that is not being turned, if that's not being monetized, if that's not being turned into revenue, into this stuff, it doesn't matter. And that's actually what happened when all that, all that boom turned around because they weren't making money. All right, investing activities. Investing activities are the acquisition and disposal of long-term assets and other investments not included in cash equivalents. Payments to acquire property, plant, and equipment, receipts from sale of property, plant, and equipment. Now, if you saw this positive, is that a good thing? Maybe yes. What's that? It means you're selling assets. Yeah, so it means if you're seeing that positive, it means you're selling off non-current assets. So is that a good thing? Okay. That's almost a really good answer for everything in accounting. It depends. It does depend. If it's negative, it means you're buying property, plant, and equipment. Is that a good thing? It depends. What could it depend on? I know this is kind of going out the scope of necessarily this subject into more kind of financial statement analysis, but let's just, you know, sort of go with it. What could it depend on? Why are you selling so, this? Aaron, they put it. Uh, how old the like was it a growth company or was it a mature company? Yeah, so life, life, sort of life cycle stage. Okay, so ballpark something. So if they're a growth company, what would you like to see? Like to see more investments. Yeah, so they're, I suppose they're expanding their operations and sort of setting things up. So that could be, so if they're sort of a younger company, you're likely to see it be negative because they're, they're building up. Anything else it could depend on? Is that the same thing. What he said. Yeah. Um, Going to ask a question of you guys. Now, maybe, maybe you'll answer, maybe you won't. Um, a few years ago, these were really, really popular. They may still be popular, I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, Crocs. <laughs> Will anyone own up to owning a pair of Crocs? Do you still own them? Not anymore. Um, they were really popular at one point. Like, they were going gangbusters. Now, I don't. I'm not, the, I'm not the person to be asking about fashion, although I don't know if they necessarily fall under the remit of fashion, but I'm not the person to be asking about it. But for whatever reason, they were popular. And I, think, and I remember reading this a few years ago, that they'd actually, they're not as popular now, but they'd actually expanded. They saw sort of growth was happening. They, they had expanded. They'd actually built up, they'd sort of built up more sort of manufacturing capability just as the market turned for them. So you want to have a look at what the strategy of the firm is, the life cycle, the surge, life, cycle, life cycle stage of the firm, macroeconomic conditions. It relates to a lot of things which aren't necessarily accounting numbers. It's broader aspects which are going to influence that. Financing activities. Activities that result in changes in the size and composition of the contributed equity and borrowings of the entity. Basically, are you borrowing money? Are you repaying it? Are you issuing are you issuing shares? Are you buying back shares? So things related to the financial structure of the business. Again, whether this is positive or negative, it kind of depends. Even sort of the items within it may depend because you may be, you may be issuing shares to pay off debt. So the actual net effect of this may be fairly minimal, but you're changing the composition of the structure of the financial structure of the business. So again, this is sort of getting outside of our remit, but it's useful to sort of think about this as you start moving into subjects beyond this. Presentation. Now, operating cash flows. So there's operating, investing, financing cash flows. Operating cash flows can use either the direct or the indirect method. 
The direct method is the one, actually going back about five or six years ago, the direct method in Australia was the only method that Australian companies could use. Even though international standards allowed both, the Australian, the AASB actually prevented Australian companies from using the indirect method. Um, that got changed a few years back. But research, I was actually involved in some research on this. Basically, most Australian companies, as to when we did it a few years ago, still keep using the direct method. It is the preferred method of the regulators. Um, and the direct method is the only method that we will look at from a practical point of view. So I know in undergrad, I think you do direct and indirect. We will only look at the direct method. And the direct method starts off with, a you're starting off with a zero starting point. So if I'm selling $100 worth of stuff to you guys and I'm paying my suppliers 80, I would have $100 of cash inflow. That's what you guys have paid me. I'd have $80 of cash outflow. The indirect method starts at profit and then adjusts back to cash flow from operations. That's not what we're doing in this subject. Financing and investing, um, all the major classes of gross cash receipts and payments presented separately. Um, so you don't net together, if you're buying property and selling property, you don't just have a net, this is our proceeds from all our property activities, you separate them out to see what you bought, what you sold. But in certain circumstances, and it's worthwhile having a look at this, in certain circumstances, you can net them together. I'm going to take a punt that some of you, probably, maybe not all of you, but some of you, some of you would be living at home, I'd say. Some of you may be renting. Think about it from, and I don't know how necessarily different people have different rental arrangements. Like for me, I, I actually rent and I actually directly pay my landlord. So there's no agent in between the process. So whatever cash I provide, that is what they actually end up getting. There's no agency fee in the middle. But if you're running through an agent, you will generally, when I used to run through an agent, you will pay the agent, let's just arguably say it's 200 bucks a week. And then the agent will remit that to the landlord and maybe give them 180 or $190. And they'll take a small cut as it flows through. So should the agent have cash flows of 200 in and 180 out, or just $20 in? It's a rhetorical. Um, I don't, but no, it's something to think about. Do you think, based on the business model, think about how the business model may affect that. So yeah, they are literally getting that money in and coming out, but should they be reporting that money as a cash flow? So potentially it's not always as cut and dried around just the money flowing through the entity the business model may also affect it. Uh, interest and dividends. So we're getting close to the end before we get into the practical side of things. Now this is an interesting one because there is choice for these. So we've got operating, financing and investing cash flows. Interest and dividends shall be classified in a consistent manner and you actually get to choose amongst all three of them. Now think about that. Interest, let's just focus on interest because it's easy to talk about. Interest is because you're, you borrowed money. Borrowed money is a financing activity. Therefore, it would seem to make sense that interest should go as a financing activity because you borrowed money. It seems to all fit together. But then if you borrowed that, if you borrowed that money to buy property, Profit, buying that property is an investing activity. And from an accounting point of view, all the costs, and we didn't go into borrowing costs specifically, but all the costs of getting that asset to where you need it to be and in, its, in, its, and in the manner that you need to use it, all those costs get capitalized against the asset. So from a cash flow perspective, you could almost say, well, should this borrowing cost, because we borrowed it to get this asset, is that not an investing activity? Or you could be using that borrowing to just finance working capital, just, you're just general suppliers and things going on there. So maybe that's just a normal part of your operations that you borrow money on a, just a rolling basis. Maybe it's an operating thing. You can choose where you put them, is the upshot of paragraph 31. But you've got to be consistent with it. Now again, from, a, from an analysis point of view, that actually causes some complications because you can't just take from a database or you can't just take from somewhere else and just go, 
well, I've got a cash flow from operations of company X and cash flow from, comp cash flow from operations of company Y. I'm just going to compare the two because they have exactly the same th things in there. Interest may be in cash flow from operations in one, it may be somewhere else for another one. So you just need to be careful what's actually housed where. Tax has a default setting of operating activities, but can go other places. Right here. So that brings us to the practical question that we have. And I want to talk a little bit about this practical question because it actually, because in reality, you wouldn't be doing cash flow statements like this. You're not going to be doing it because we're going to do it by hand. And you know, accounting doesn't happen by hand. Um, there are different ways you could do it. And I think the textbook goes through one of them. You can do a formula type method. That's obviously not the formula for a cash flow statement. You can do a formula type method for a cash flow statement. And if you look through the textbook, it could be like for receipts from customers, opening accounts receivable, plus sales, less provision for doubtful debts, less whatever you end up with. I can't remember it. It's complicated to do. And you've got to remember it for each particular block. It actually gets quite convoluted. If that is the way you want to do it and you're good at doing those sort of things and you can remember it, go for your life. I would just not advocate going down that path. Computers, obviously, is pretty much how life works nowadays. But until we get to the point in which we have computers in assessment centers and in exam rooms, we're still bound by pen and paper to do this. So spreadsheets, you know, accounting software packages, all the rest of it, we can't use. So what we do do, um, and until, and I know this gets done even in um, the professional qualification, so this is a cheery thought. If you're interested in going off and doing accounting after university, if you sort of professional qualifications, the CA program, and I would say the CPA is exact, it'd be much the same, the CA program, you will do all of this again. The financial reporting module for the CA program is this subject and ABC all rolled into one. Yeah. Going through it, it's like, yeah, we do all of that. It's slightly different, but it's pretty much the same. Um, so anyway, you will see a lot of this again. The way that they do cash flows is actually about, is the same way that I'm about to talk about. Until they get computers in their assessment centers, it will still be done this way. Now. It is very much about problem solving, but I want, to I want to preface this, and I think potentially you may remember this. It helps me remember this. It's what's called the reconstruction method, or as I like to call it, it's the hangover method. And there is a reason for this. I don't have to worry about this out of this sort of thing much anymore because I don't, you know, getting on a bit, don't really go out. So I'm not really in a situation where I have to concern myself with this. But as a good accountant, when I go out, what I couch as a good night will be dependent on how much I spend on said night. Now, the thing is, I could take out a notepad and pen and kind of write things down when I go to the bar and how much the drink costs and whatnot. But I'm pretty sure at some point in the night, and you can kind of figure out when you think that could be, that isn't going to really work anymore. Now, also, just trying to remember this stuff is probably not a good way. So the way that I do it, or used to do it, is figure out how much is in my wallet at the start of the night. Write that down, leave it at home. Come home, like, next day, check what's in my wallet the next morning. Ah, oh, you know, started with 100, end up with 80. That was a really cheap night, 20 bucks, not too bad. That's what we're doing. We're using a starting point and we're using an ending point. And we're making assumptions about what happens in the middle. That is exactly the process we're going to go through. Now, I'm not saying there needs to be drinking involved when it comes to actually doing this but that is what we're doing. Why wouldn't I have spent $20 on that night out? What's that? I would have spent more, but why is just looking at the opening, wall, opening amount in my wallet and the closing amount, why is that not going to tell me the whole tale? What's that? Yeah, I might have then find the ATM receipt and it's like, oh, really? 
So that is another piece of information. So until I have that piece of information, I've spent $20. Then you find the $200 ATM receipt and it's like, oh, hang on, things have got a bit worse. What else could happen? Somebody will you drinks. Oh, someone else can bought you drinks, but for me, accountant, that's right. zero cost. So, you know, that's all good. <laughs> what else goes on? I might have lent money. What's that? I might have been, yeah, potentially someone might have, I might have borrowed money off someone at the time, which is problematic when you do that late at night because usually it doesn't come back. Um, what else could go on? Are we not fun? What's that? Are we not fun? Yes. Although, given my tipping form, I don't think that would actually help me. Um, I get my credit card bill a month later. That's awesome. There are other pieces of information we're looking for. That is the point of it. We have a starting point, opening balance sheet. We have an ending point, closing balance sheet. Nothing else, no other information provided. We spent $20. We find the $200 ATM receipt, we spent $220. We find credit card bills, we borrowed money, we lent money, whatever. We find out other information that will affect the things that we're looking at. This is, so this is the example that you guys have. 2013 on the right hand side, that is our starting point. What we end up with for all of those accounts at 2014, that is our ending point. We're looking for how those accounts change over that year. Look at cash right up the top, $100,000 to $100,200. Net cash inflow, $200. That means everything else has to equal, I suppose offset that $200 increase in cash to make everything work out. We need to go line by line. And before anyone gets worried about this, some of these lines are actually quite quick to go through. But we actually have to go through line by line to figure out where these changes have occurred. Now to save me flipping back and forward between this slide and the next ones that we go through, I'm going to make the assumption that you have this information in front of you. It will make this next section a hell of a lot easier to deal with. <coughs> we have some additional information. If you look through the information that we have, it's pretty much Pretty much profit and loss information, yes. You couldn't print it out before you came. You could have downloaded it. All right. Profit plan equipment, net profit, dividends, income tax, sales and admin, interest expense, cost of goods sold, sales. Most of that would be in a profit and loss statement. Not all of it, but most of it could be there. What you are doing is trying to deduce where something comes from that affects the particular item that you're, the particular balance sheet item that you're looking at. <coughs> Actually, comment. If you were to get an exam question on this to do a full cash flow statement, the first, the last two slides we had would be the information. You wouldn't get the setup. You wouldn't get this laid out. But there is something which will help you with that. And this is why it's useful to turn up to class. AASB 107, back of it in the appendices, you actually have a template for what's in a cash flow statement. So you don't need to remember any of this. We don't need to provide it because you've already got it with you in class or in the exam as long as you bring it with you. It's in the appendices to 107. So it's just, in, you go to 107, you go to flick to the back of it and there is a, an example of a full cash flow statement. Um, but you know, by the time you come into walking into the exam, you should just know this. It'll be like, just like that. Okay, payments from customers. So we'll start off that. So what we're gonna do is, the way this works, accounts, Okay, T accounts, uh, you don't have to do it with T accounts, but I think it actually makes it a lot easier and it graphically really identifies where, where the things you need to deal with it are. Accounts receivable, sales, and if I can find where the pointer is, you literally just put in the opening and closing balances. One oh six. Start of the year, people owed us seventy-two thousand. End of the year, people owed us one hundred and six. 
You could say, well, we sold about $30,000 of stuff and our collection policy is horrible. Or that you actually sold a whole bunch of stuff and you collected, but we don't know how much. You go down to note eight and sales totaled 301,330. And that would be debits account, debit account receivable credit sales 301,330, which is 301,330. Okay, and that's all we know. You can scan through the rest of the information that you have there. We've got no allow allowance from doubtful debts. We've got nothing else happening in that particular space. You can pretty obviously see that doesn't work. That's not balancing. And that's why this method is really handy. You do that in a formula, you forget which one you want to add or subtract, and you can't actually verify it by looking at it. You look at that and you go, we know there has to be, there has to be something here, because it's not going to work otherwise. And in that case, when you all sort of crunch it through, which I need to double check, no, what am I talking about? It's on the screen. When you crunch it through, that gives you 266. Because the other part to that entry would be debit cash. So that is the cash inflow that you have from payments, from receipts from customers. And pretty much, Everything else is actually just taking that theme and just rolling it through. So what I'm going to do, we will go through the main ones, um, but some of them have trickier parts than others. So. Okay. So we've done 266700, bless you. Now, to do payments to suppliers, accounts payable, we roll inventory into this, cost of goods sold, sales and admin expense. Um, because what we're considering with payments to suppliers is not just you know, suppliers which we bought inventory from, but it's staff, it's all the various other things that we do to keep the business ticking over. You'll see you can, if you want, split that out to payments to, supply, payments to employees, payments to suppliers, depending on the information that you have available. But for this example, we're collapsing everything into just what do we pay for just our sort of operating activities um, outside of interest and tax. So to do this again, we follow the same process. Accounts payable, we have, where is it? Uh, I've not given myself enough room. Eighty-seven, eight, ten, and 103,690. Inventory starts with 90. 95, cost of goods sold is an expense, so zero starting, and sales and admin is an expense, so zero starting. So all that I've done there is just take the given information and just put it into T accounts. There's nothing dramatic that's happened at this point. Now the first thing we need to do is to look at how much inventory we purchased. And we look at cost of goods sold to start that process off. But cost of goods sold was 50,000. So that would be a debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. So those two link. We can see that if we had our opening balance and took out what we spent or we took out what we sold, that doesn't give you the closing balance of 95, which is means we purchased something and we've purchased $55,000 worth of is missing zero. So we've come up with $55,000 as the amount of inventory that has been purchased. Um, what, what would the cost of goods good sold be taken into inventory? Because in cost of goods sold, there might be labor, there might be... 
Yeah, yeah, no, but remember all, yeah, no, you're right, but all of those labor costs and overheads and all that will actually be embedded within that 90,000. Like, let's just say all that cost of goods sold at 50 was from opening inventory. All of those costs are embedded within the inventory figure yourself. So you are right in the sense that we need to take into account, but they already are. So that 90 is our opening inventory. We sold off $50,000 of it. That gives us a $40,000 balance, but we actually had a balance of 95, which means we have purchased over time $55,000 worth of inventory. Does that mean we have paid our suppliers $55,000 for inventory? No. no. We might have paid on credit, or well, not, not paid, we might have bought them on credit and not paid them back yet. So we add that to accounts payable, those two link. Sales and admin expense, for number five was 47,630. We're assuming that doesn't include depreciation. You'll be told if, it should be very clear if something has depreciation embedded in it. 47,630. I know I've sort of scrunched it up there a bit, but 87 plus 55 plus 47, you can pretty much agree just by looking at it, doesn't equal 103. So then we just need to figure out what we take away to make it equal to 103. Because we need something over here. And that amount is whatever you've paid to suppliers, which in this case is 86,750, which is this number that you've got up here. I'll give you guys a moment. If you refer back to the information in this case, interest and tax are really straightforward. Actually, sort it, I'll go back. If you look at item six, interest expense all paid, 20,000. It's paid, it's a $20,000 payment. Income, income tax shouldn't be declared, but ignore that. Um, income tax, expensed and paid during the year, it was 5,000. Again, it's been told that that is what was paid. More to the point, if you scan through all the lists of accounts, there is not one in there which says anything about tax, there's not one in there which says anything about interest. There's nothing we need to worry about. That's not to say you're not gonna come across changing current tax liability balances, changing deferred tax asset balances, changing deferred tax liability balances, figuring out how that interacts with tax expense and then what you actually pay. Those things happen. Revaluations taking place which affect deferred tax liabilities. There's actually quite a lot of moving parts that could take place in this, so you need to be aware of that. For this, really straightforward. So interest paid was just because we got told it was paid. Tax paid, we got told it was tax paid. So again, just based on the information that we have. Okay, investing activities. Only two of them. One of them is actually really, stra really straightforward. The other, we need to do a little bit of work on. Proceeds from sale of property, plant, and equipment. Now, let's draw everything up and figure out where we're at. Uh, property, plant, and equipment. Accumulated depreciation. I think that's about all we need. So property, plant, and equipment starts at 483, 550. Accumulated depreciation starts at 185, and ends at 185, 710. All right. <coughs> Good case in point of opening balance of my wallet, closing balance of my wallet. If this is the only information that we have here, we could assume that, that depreciation expense for the year was in the order of what, $18,000 there or thereabouts, and something has caused property, plant and equipment to go up. Now, question for you guys. What could cause an increase in property, plant and equipment going up, the actual account itself? 
if I don't know there's like noise coming out of here could be a revaluation could be a revaluation that is one reason property plant recruitment could go up what is the other thing that could happen yeah we could have bought something pretty much those are the likely things that you're going to see now is a revaluation a cash or non-cash item non-cash you will be told explicitly well, okay, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit from that. You will be able to work out very clearly if it has been a revaluation. We could tell you there has been a revaluation, which kind of tends to suggest that you can see what's going on. How else could you figure out there has been a revaluation if we don't explicitly tell you? There is a surplus? Yeah, there's been a change in rebal surplus. So we may not say there has been a revaluation, but you see a revaluation surplus taking place or like changing, that is probably a good indicator something's going on. If we give you no guidance about what's going on, it has been a purchase. And if we tell you nothing about said purchase, it has been a purchase for cash consideration. Because you can get purchases not for cash consideration. Again, you need to be aware of that. But in this case, there is information that we have, so we need to look at it. And the information that you have is from note one. And that information is you sold something and the cost of what you sold was 50, 40. The carrying value of what you sold was 6150 and it was sold for okay. So from that, that sold for amount is the proceeds from sale because we sold it for something. If you sold it for a profit of something, that would be different. You would need to look at what the, what the gain on sale was um, and then you need to see how much cash you made from that. But in this case, it was sold for 7150 which makes that really straightforward to do. With this... In this particular example, we don't need to work out how much accumulated depreciation was gotten rid of because we don't actually need to use it. But you may need to, need to build that in. Um, and accumulated depreciation gotten rid of was just the cost of the asset we sold, take away the carrying value of it. That is how much accumulated depreciation is attached. Because when we sell this, This is derecognized from the asset, which is what's happening here. And the accumulated depreciation amount. 43890. 43890. Thank you. This is what we get rid of off the balance sheet. And then you can see the depreciation expense should be in the order of about seventy, eighty thousand dollars. Four eight thirty, five fifty, four hundred eighty three, five fifty less fifty thousand gives you about four hundred thirty thousand dollars. That's not what we end up with. We have no other information. We have had a purchase of about seventy, seventy seven thousand dollars in this case. So this is the gap we're trying to fill. That's a cash outflow if you're not told anything else. These aren't combined. We're showing them as acquisition and proceeds. We're not netting them out to say, look, total net proceed, total net cost of acquisition of assets is 70,000 odd. We're actually showing them separately to see how we're doing things. And we end up with cash flows from investing activities of 70,810. Um, David, time, uh, do we not consider the depreciation when we're uh, finding out the acquisition of PPE? Do you find the, the increasing the net value or just the cost? No, nah, just cost, because if you're buying property plan equipment, it'll just come on your books. Just It'll just be debit, asset, credit, cash, yeah. um, or debit, Debit, asset, credit, whatever consideration it is, and we're assuming cash, so credit cash. All right, last one, financing activities. 
Um, actually, for this, I'll go back to the information again because it, it's the easiest way to do this. To deal with any changes in borrowings, we go to liabilities. We've already dealt, we've already dealt with accounts payable. We look at debentures. Debentures change from 97,000 to 84. That means in the principal amount of the debenture, the principal amount of the debt, we have paid back some of it. So that has been a change and it's been a negative change. So this has changed and it's gone from 97 to 84. So it's gone down. So that means there has been a cash outflow. And that difference is, let me find my piece of paper. It's like 13,000 or something. <clears throat> that difference is um, look if you want you could do T accounts for that but realistically you can just see it happening debentures has gone from 97 to 84 is down, going down by 13,000 which means cash has gone out of the business ordinary shares is the equity side of things now this is a pretty ridiculous example because equity has gone up it has changed and it's gone up by 560. So we've issued $560. Uh, sorry, 560. <laughs> yeah, I'd be really worried there for a second. Cool. Um, so we've had ordinary shares go up by 560. These aren't, this isn't picking up market value of those shares. This is you've issued new shares. Why you would issue only $560 worth of shares, I don't know, but that's what's happened. The last one, in this case, I'm going to show it to you for around dividends and then I'm going to ask you guys a question to finish things up with. Figure out your accounting knowledge. Dividends is the last thing we do, which in this point is really, really easy. Dividends declared and paid during the year was 71,280. It explicitly says paid. We had the 13,220, we just, we just discussed. We had the 560, which we've discussed. We've got the payment of dividends, which is 71,280, which is in the additional information. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to, I don't want to start packing up just yet. Hold your horses. <coughs> Based on this information, we have a line in there, line three, dividends declared and paid during the year was 71,280. If we didn't have, <clears throat> if we didn't have that, if that line didn't exist, you could still do it. So what would you be looking for to be able to answer how much dividends or how much the total cash dividend was paid during the year? What would tell you? Yeah, retained earnings and adding in the profit effect. So retained earnings, retained earnings has gone from 236, 260 to 282. It's gone up, but it's gone up by about, what's that, 50, 50 ish thousand dollars. Our net profit after tax is given to us at 117. That's not picking up that effect. So we've had opening retained earnings plus profit would give us a number way bigger than what we end with the difference is retained earnings. So you've got to be aware that you may see things which don't necessarily, which aren't necessarily told to you explicitly. Now a really quick comment on a good way to sort of work through this sort of question. As you deal with each account, so the first thing that we did, I won't do all of this, but the first thing that we did was receipts from customers, accounts receivable sales. We deal with that, tick it off, because all of these have to be dealt with. If this goes up by 200, net, all the rest of it has to go down by 200. Everything has got to be involved. Accounts receivable, we deal with, and sales and ad, oh, sorry, sales total this, we tick off that. You should actually be able to work through each piece of information and it should help, it should help you do what you need to do. Just look through it, and that's the, best way to go about it, be systematic. 
and that is the finished product. Generally speaking, if we ask for a cash flow or a statement of cash flows, or if we ask for a section of it, we actually want it to look like this. We don't want it all in sort of discrete parts sort of spread around the page. If we ask for a statement of cash flows like this, starting balance, like starting matter, or see the front matter, the net increase, the starting period, ending your period cash balances, all those little bits. But again, if you've got the standards with you, you will have that stuff in the exam. So there's no reason why you shouldn't. And that's it. So we covered what cash flows are. We looked at why cash flow statements are important and we looked at the regulation. If anyone's got any questions, I'll be here for a few minutes before I head upstairs for the tutorial. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next week. Hopefully the blues will get up on Wednesday night. That said, I'm not, as you are, I'm not super confident about it. But maybe I'll just tip the Maroons to give them the kiss of death. Have a good weekend and I shall see you guys next Thursday.